teach enough or share with you about the uh, tradition from which we come, the older I get, the more I am comforted, uh, the more I turn to a tradition. We are, uh, as Episcopalians, uh, church fancy terms, because I know we have people from many different traditions, we are both Protestant and Catholic, because that uh, those English Christians that we call Anglicans, our tradition is an Anglican tradition. It's a fusion of Celtic, English, Protestant, and Catholic. When that all gets mixed together, one of the great gifts that we are given, and the older I get, the more I'm appreciating turning to Scripture, turning to the Bible. Not just for big, big questions of life, but to answer questions about daily living. This week, we were hit with two Category 4 storms. The first storm was named Matthew. The second storm is named Election. And they both blew hard and caused a great deal of damage and displacement in our country. When these storms happen, I am asked all the time, why is this happening? Why would God allow this? What are we supposed to, what can I do? I feel so helpless in moments like this. What, how are we supposed to live in moments like this? And this is where, in our Anglican tradition, it really is true that you can turn to the Bible and receive some guidance for daily living. Our scriptures today, it's just a normal Sunday in the Episcopal Church. We've got a three-year cycle of readings. Everybody knows this. We're reading the same readings in the Catholic Church today, in the Methodist, the Lutheran Church, um, some, some Presbyterian churches. You know, everybody knows this. But what if we asked these readings to speak to us about the storms in, that we are experiencing. What would they say? Shall we? Let's turn to Jeremiah, please, in your bulletin for just a moment. Page 4 and 5 will get you there. Old Jeremiah knew quite a bit about storms. He had lived through a world that had fallen apart around him. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had come to Jerusalem, had utterly destroyed it. The temple is destroyed. The wall is destroyed. Jerusalem is rubble. And Nebuchadnezzar took the youngest, the brightest, the best of the Jerusalem community, and he took them with him back to Babylon. It's a forced exodus. They are exiles. They're refugees in Babylon. He left everybody who was old because, you know, they can't contribute anything. Jeremiah was too old to make the trip, so Nebuchadnezzar leaves him. And ironically, one of the great ironies of the history of the Bible, the people that are left, they can't stay. They go to Egypt as refugees. Jeremiah is in Egypt in the final years of his life. He's preached for over 40 years, and no one paid any attention. You think your marriage is tough? Let me introduce you to Jeremiah. 40 years, no one listened. And everything that Jeremiah predicted came true precisely. So he's in Egypt. He knows that the exiles in Babylon are having a terribly difficult time. Their world has been destroyed, just like our Haitian brothers and sisters. Uh, we got a call from our mission partner in Haiti. Uh, the, our church throughout the state supports a beautiful school and a church. And um, the, the, the message on the call was, there's nothing left to clean up. It was scraped completely away. This is what happened in Jerusalem. Jeremiah knows that these people are shattered and they don't know what to do. So he writes a letter and sends the letter from Egypt to Babylon. And let's see what this letter says. 
um, on the bottom of page 4. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah sent to uh, the, all the people that Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who's in charge, please? Who's in charge when things are great? Who's in charge when things go to hell? Who's in charge no matter who wins the election? Who's in charge if you vote one way or the other? Who's in charge if you ride in Obi-Wan Kenobi? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? I'm so sorry. Who's in charge? God. God's in charge. God says to Jeremiah, Hey, I have a plan. You didn't know it, but this is part of the plan. God continues through Jeremiah. Oh my God, realtors and developers are in the Bible. Do you see this here? Bonnie is smiling. Build houses and live in them. Where are they to build the house? In Babylon. In foreign territory. They're supposed to build and live in a home. What else are they supposed to do? Plant gardens. Don, let's take it one step at a time. Before children, you need a garden. I know, it's exciting to get to that part, isn't it? When I, when I interviewed for this position in 1995, every single member of your vestry looked me in the eye and said, Oh, you can grow tomatoes here. It's so fun to garden here. You lied to me. All those years ago, chemicals, Prayer, I have never grown one tomato to eat ever. And when you come to my house, I'm lying. I buy them, of course. But God says, plant your gardens. They take time, don't they? Build a house, plant a garden, and settle down and make babies. Build a family. Take care of the people that are closest to you when times are like they are. Do the things that bring you life. Do the things that you know how to do. Losing our heads in days like this is not allowed. We can watch people on TV lose their heads. It is not allowed for us as believers. In times like this, we are to send roots deep into the soil of family. To take care of the people closest to us. To tend to the garden of our lives no matter what you're trying to harvest. To see to those daily things that bring us life. That's what we do, Jeremiah said, in days like this. And then to care for our children, our grandchildren, and to celebrate the moments of life that matter. Jeremiah said, have a wedding and have a party. We accomplished that last weekend in Nashville, completely. Have a birthday party. Go out for supper. Do the things that bring your lives peace and strength, and clarity, and focus. When everything else is falling apart around you, Jeremiah said to the exiles, you cannot fall apart. That's not what God desires. Wow. He finally says, when you've got your family well, your garden is producing everything in veil except tomatoes. <laughs> when you have a house, and it's a good place, then seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. Could you imagine? These are the people that took them into exile. They destroyed Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is saying, now you have to reach out in your community. 
Is it a Christian response in days like this to pull in, pull the drawbridge up, build big walls, and separate ourselves from the world? Is that the right response? I'm asking. Jeremiah said, no way. Anxiety, depression, confusion, stress pulls us in. It separates us. It separates husbands and wives. It separates parents and children. It separates co-workers. It can put us into a deep, dark, dank place. And God says, no way. We are supposed to be engaged and involved in the community in which we live. I would shudder to think what this community would be like without you. I would be here. You are the ones that leaven the loaf in this community. There was an old word uh, about welfare. The English translation here is not welfare like a bread line or a check. Welfare is taking care and being concerned and involved with the community around us. This is not the time to pull up and this is a time to reach out in God's name to people that need love, support, assistance, and encouragement. You can be the only gospel I often say that anybody ever reads. You can do that. We are to be engaged in the affairs of the world. You're darn right I talk to Richard Carnes every week. Because he's not going to have an article that I don't have a response to. Yes, I read the Tuesday Daily. You know? Are we to be engaged in the political process? Yes. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care your political party, really. What I do care about is the tone and the quality of how we comport ourselves in this moment. It's important. It's more important now than it's ever been. That's just one reading. <laughs> Isn't the Bible pretty cool? Let's turn to uh, let's turn to page six. Paul is older again. This is the Apostle Paul, no longer Jeremiah. We're, we're, we're 800 years now to Paul. Paul is an elderly man. He's arrested. He's in chains. He knows he's going to die soon, and he's writing to his uh, protege, his apprentice, Timothy. And he's pouring out his heart in two letters to Timothy before he dies to say, this is the man, this is the leader I want you to be. And he's writing, and he gets down towards the bottom of this selection. And he says, remind them of this, and meaning the people that Timothy is serving, the church, and warn them before God that they, to, they are to avoid wrangling over words. How did Paul watch CNN? <laughs> Breaking news. Paul doesn't care. Wrangling over words. Why? Paul says they do no good but only ruins everyone else who is listening. How many words do we use that are literally wasted words? They just don't matter. I was flying back, our family was flying back from Nashville to Denver. The southwestern flight, the two back wheels touch the tarmac, you know, first. And what are people doing in the plane? This is awesome. They turn on their cell phones before the front wheel has actually touched the tarmac. This is information that people need in their lives. What well, we're landing right now, the plane's touching down right now. Great. That's great. Um, does that matter? Can anybody change anything in that moment? No. And then you get the narrative about how long it takes the plane. Because this is critically important communication. How long it takes the plane to taxi. 
and how long it's taking people in front of us to unpack their things. I mean, how many words do we waste? And we wrangle, to use a good biblical term. What if we use words that weren't wrangling words? Do you know that your words matter? I, I want to tell every young person here, everybody clue in, everybody that's young, look at me. Instagram never goes away. It's always somewhere on Instagram. It never really goes away. There is no away. If your evil twin takes over your Facebook posting at midnight, guess what? It's there forever. Twitter is there forever. Email, can you imagine how different people sound in front of a screen versus in front of real life? Isn't it interesting how coarse we can get so quickly? What if you and I make a commitment that every time we're in front of any screen, we can imagine ourselves standing in front of the entire congregation of our church, and they were reading what we were writing? What do you think? Would it change what you say? Isn't that as Christians? Aren't we supposed to be carrying God everywhere? What if we only were to speak to build somebody else up and not to tear them down? How would that change the storms that we're experiencing today in life? Wouldn't that be interesting? Can I tell you, down at the bottom, Paul says, do your best to present yourself to God as one that God would approve of. A skilled worker who never needs to be ashamed because you rightly can explain and speak the word of truth. Um, some of these storms have to do with integrity, don't they? When I was ordained a deacon before being ordained a priest, a good mentor of mine said, Brooks, here's how you be a good priest. Be the same person on Saturday night that you are on Sunday morning. Guess what I tell my teenage daughter? Honey, be the same person on Saturday night that you are on Sunday morning. Isn't that pretty good direction and counsel? Be the same person in front of a screen that you are in front of everybody else. Speak so you never be ashamed. No matter what comes back, of anything that you say, the Christian bar always goes up. We are called to be up. The Christian bar goes up over time. It never goes down. God calls us to the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's a high call. Finally, let's look at that. Uh, let's look at the cover. I think this cover really captures the story better than the words. <laughs> Do you see nine people dancing away? Isn't that cool? They're like strutting. Because, you know, lepers can't do that. <laughs> They're being healed. So here's the setup. This is great. Jesus is going into town. Ten lepers, they live outside of town because they're so gross and disgusting that they never allow them into town. And so Jesus comes walking by the road with friends, and the lepers do what they always do all over the world. They ask you for money. Don't be confused by the text. Lord Jesus, or Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, is code word in the Bible for, Do you, could you give us money to live? Jesus looks at them and he says, Wow, I know what you really need. And it's not money. It's not coin. So Jesus says, in good Jewish fashion, go show yourself to a priest. And uh, it actually says, just go show yourself to the priest. Torah says that's what you do when you have leprosy. As they go, what happens? Can you imagine if you had been suffering from a terminal illness and all of a sudden you're cleansed? You're going to look like these guys on the cover of our bulletin. You're going to be strutting around. It's going to be pretty exciting. You're throwing down stuff. Hey, you've got fingers. Look at that. I, you know, it's awesome. Awesome. As they're being clean, all of a sudden, you can see who they really are. You couldn't tell before, because leprosy hides that. 
Nine of them are Jewish. One is a Samaritan. So the Jewish men go to the priest. That's what they've been taught to do. One person stops and says, Who just healed me? My life just changed. Who can do that? And he turns around and he goes to Jesus. Do you see him on the ground? Prostrated on the ground. And he says, Thank you. He's totally overwhelmed. And Jesus says, Get up. Live the rest of your life now. Your faith is making you well. Friends, at the Thursday morning men's Bible study, we asked each other as men, when was the last time you thanked God for every blessing that you have? When was the last time you looked at Jesus and said, thank you for the life that I've been given? Is there a connection between faith and healing and wellness? The answer is yes. If you and I spend more time with Wolf Blitzer than we spend with Jesus, we're in the wrong place. And we're going to be sick, literally. Days like these call us to be connected with Jesus on a very intimate level. To turn to Him all the time and say, Lord, thank you for what I have. Many of us have been trained to ask God about what we don't have. This story tells us to thank God for what we do have. If you think you don't have enough as everybody else, let me take you to Port-au-Prince and ask you about your life. It's a living parable right now. Friends, can the Bible speak to storms? Can the Bible give us guidance and direction in our daily lives? The answer is more than we can stand. Please hear the words today. Because the words that we are given are the words of life and truth. And we can stand in any storm. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.